Dennis, thanks. Good morning, colleagues. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hello, uh, everything has gone mute. Is it on my side only? No, no, we are waiting for the participants to be admitted and then we start. Oh, okay, all right. Five minutes. Yeah. And so, um, guys, maybe this would be the best time to let you know how the program looks like. So I will start off very briefly just to welcome everyone. And then I will hand it over to our executive director, Ms. Wangeshi Washira, who will also be officially now welcoming everyone to this uh, webinar and she'll do her brief remarks. And then she will quickly hand it over to Dr. Len, uh, Dr. JB, who is our keynote speaker for today. Uh, Dr. JB, I will give you exactly uh, 10 minutes 10 to 12 minutes for the keynote speaking. And then this then will be followed by Dr. Lina, who will then be disseminating the findings of the studies, where she will take about uh, 30 minutes to do the dissemination and about 10 minutes to, for the Q&A. And then I'm hoping that by 11, we'll get into the panel discussion. So as it has been displayed there, thank you very much, Dennis. That is the um, part of our undertakings for today, for this morning and afternoon. I hope, I hope the program is visible to everyone. It is, thank you. Okay. Brilliant. So Dennis, you can continue to admit people. And I think once we get to 10.08, 10 we'll start.
Good morning, good morning, everyone. Good morning, participants. Good morning, colleagues. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. We indeed do appreciate that you've taken time to join us in this very important conversation. Uh, today, we are going to be doing two things. We are going to be having a discussion regarding women experience on intimate partner violence during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and this is because all around people have been saying, and it has also been noted by the government and judiciary and national police, including civil society, that there was an increase in intimate partner violence, but no one could be able to truly quantify it what that looked like, what the increase looked like. And so today, as today, this conversation is to talk about that. And so thank you very much for joining us. Our program for today, for these two hours, uh, Dennis, if you don't mind kindly display it. This is how our program will look like for today. Uh, we are going to be having our opening remarks by our executive director, Ms. Wangeshi Washira. This will be followed by a keynote speaker, uh, Honorable Dr. Jabi Kilimo. And after her, we are going to have the dissemination of the findings of the study that we did on uh, women experience on IPV during the COVID-19 pandemic. And, it will, and at 11, it will be a panel discussion, just be able to put what the findings, what we hear into context. And then we're going to have a Q&A session after that and finally close. We truly will endeavor to ensure that we keep time. And so without much ado, I would like to invite our executive director, Ms. Wangeshi Washira, to come to the podium and welcome us. Asante sana, Ms. Wangeshi, karibu sana. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Isabella. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm told we have a, we had about 105 people registered mm -hmm. for this webinar. Um, and so far we are at about 45, so we are hoping that we'll continue to get uh, people joining in. But uh, first and foremost, I want to thank each and every one of you uh, for joining us for this uh, webinar, for this uh, conversation this morning. Kindly also allow me to really acknowledge um, the presence of uh, Dr. Jibi Kilimo, uh, who, is, uh, the chief, um, who is the Chief Administrative Secretary from the Ministry of Public Service and, and Gender, and also other panelists who will be speaking to us uh, this morning, Mary, uh, Mary Wanjiro from UN Women. We have uh, Philip coming all the way from Isiolo County, we have Consulata Waitaka, who is Executive Director, uh, Women's Hope uh, Center, and finally, Diana Kamande, who is, again, the Executive Director, Come Together Widows and, and Orphans. I'm very, very delighted that uh, this morning we are going to be having a conversation that is very, very close to my heart, and I'm sure it's also close to many of you who join us uh, this morning, because uh, from what I am seeing here, I know majority of you working either from civil society organizations, working from women's rights organizations, working from um, a government, both at the national and, and the county level. We have our development partners who join us uh, this morning. This is powerful. And I thank once again, all of you for joining us uh, for this uh, conversation. Now, why, we are, why are we here? I think we all remember last year in March when the first COVID case um, in the country was reported, um, there were a lot of um, government measures that were put in place rightfully so that then they could be able to reduce the cases of spread of COVID-19. And some of the measures were put, for example, is to work at home, uh, the closure for schools, the lockdown for a number of counties, um, and, and, and also the curfew in the evening. And whereas we acknowledge that these measures were important um, and are very key to ensuring that the spread of COVID then will be reduced, that they had also a very big effect when it comes to issues of gender-based violence. And today, really looking at issues of uh, domestic violence, looking at issues of intimate partner violence. And when you look at the global level, 
um, I think the data that is already there is already highlighting that uh, violence against women is one of the most widespread uh, violation of human rights uh, worldwide and affects women. In fact, when you look at the report from the WHO, it's very, very clear that one out of three women is going through uh, violence. When we come here to our country, I know our government has also acknowledged that uh, violence during the period of COVID really went up. We have the research from the crimes unit. We have data from uh, the top free line, which is 1195, but also other women's rights organizations that have really been working. Just last weekend, uh, seated with uh, our colleagues from FIDA, uh, they did indicate that uh, the cases they received uh, from last year is more than um, 9,000 calls coming for women who are looking uh, for, for support. As an organization crew that has been on the front line is that we also saw a lot of cases come in and going up all the way to 53%. Uh, but when you look at that data out there, a lot of it has really been focusing on the numbers and the numbers are critical because the numbers tell us something. The numbers are also able to inform our policy. The numbers are also able to policy at the national level, but also at the county level. Numbers are also critical because they're also able to let us know what is it then we can be able to do so that then we can be able to address issues of, of, of gender-based violence. So today uh, we thought that we could go further in, uh, beyond looking at the numbers that have been put there and as an organization we have been uh, documenting uh, cases that have come to us in a number of counties and I'm very, very happy because that's a research that we'll be looking today. We looked at Nairobi, we looked at Mombasa, we also went to Kilifi, we went to Isiolo, we also went uh, to Nairobi just to sample a number of counties. What was the experience of women during uh, the period of, of COVID? What was the experience in getting services? What was the experience in um, looking for a place that they can be able to get a, a shelter or they can be able to get any form of, of, of support? So this data would really be looking at what were the risk factors of violence? What were the um, services that were available? Were they available? Were they not available? And what is it that we can be able to do better? And before I hand over to my colleague um, um, again, is that um, I would really want to thank our board of directors. I want to really thank our staff members. I know a lot of them made a, a lot of sacrifice. They went there, they were brave. When everybody else was working from home, a number of our, uh, our team members were on the front line giving legal support, giving psychosocial support, um, encouraging women, um, um, I mean, who are going through violence, giving them a shoulder to cry on. They referred them to our various uh, service providers that we work with. And I really want to acknowledge that the service providers, we cultivated a partnership. In Nairobi, for example, we worked in free shelters. We also worked with women, other women's rights organization, even based at the grassroots level, so that then they could be able to refer the cases to us and really for us to be able to give them that kind of support that was required. I will never forget our development partners who also were able to put in resources um, and, and those resources then enabled us to do the work that uh, we supported women and we continue to do that. I must also acknowledge that when we raised our voices uh, to the government of Kenya, I think it was very clear they were able to listen um, and we saw action uh, coming into place. We saw coordination happening from the national level. Uh, we have a clear gender working group. We also saw coordination happening at the county level, seeing the county government coming together and bringing all the stakeholders together so that then they can be able to respond to issues of violence against women and girls. So the report that we are going to be listening today is focusing on issues of violence against women with a very, very clear uh, focus on intimate partner violence, which we also call domestic violence. And Dr. Lina, who's been working with her team, um, and we thank you because you've been able to traverse uh, in the different parts of the country to be able to listen to women and be sharing that. As I uh, conclude, I also want to really thank the brave women uh, who were able to tell their story. It is not easy. I know along the way, there are women who lost life. There are women who lost their body parts. There are women who had to run away from a home that they have built or a home they called, this is the place to be. Be, but they had to leave because it, it was uh, it was violent. But constantly um, negotiating within themselves and finally saying, "I better leave 
um, as a woman other than to wait for me to die. And I think this has been our call that we encourage women who are going through violence to get out of this abusive home so that then they can be able to live um, in, in a way that is uh, dignified. And it's better to have a daughter who comes back home other than for us to wait for a coffin to be brought home. So for us really uh, to thank the brave women who are interviewed to really appreciate that they were able to air their voice, they were able to share their personal stories. Sometimes they are very, very difficult to share and they were able to put this so that then we can be able to amplify their voice. So we applaud them, we acknowledge them and we celebrate them for really speaking about um, the issues that they went, uh, they went through. So allow me now uh, to invite our guest speaker um, who is um, a phenomenal woman and, and I really admire the work that she has been done, uh, she has been doing around issues of female genital mutilation. She's also very, very passionate. She served as a member of, uh, of parliament um, for Mar uh, Marrakech East uh, constituency between the, uh, the period 2002 all the way to 2012. But now she's also holding a very, very powerful position where our work is domiciled and she continued to be a big advocate. She continued to speak about these issues. She's able to listen to us. She's a chief administrative uh, Secretary for the State Department of, of Gender, that is Honorable J.B. Kilimo. Dr. J.B. Kilimo, we are very, very happy to have you this morning. We admire the work that you do. We are very, very honored to be with your presence. And when we made this invitation, you did not even hesitate. You said, consider that done. So we are very, very happy that you are able to find time to join us this morning so that we can be able to have this conversation around issues of intimate partner violence. We have lost women. And I know that uh, you'll be able to listen, you'll be able to work with us, but also take some of the recommendations within your department. So welcome, and we are very, very grateful to have you this morning. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Wangeshi, and to all our listeners. I'm humbled by the many uh, the way you've introduced me. And just to be in the middle of women, I'm really humbled. You know, when you speak like that, Wangeshi, I just feel like I wish I could be on top of a mountain and shout it for the whole world to know that women are hurting. Even after just that uh, meeting on Saturday, launching the book and hearing the stories, seeing the women without their body parts, something has to be done. And I, I really pray that as we go out, because I know you and women are here and with FIDA and uh, they're looking at uh, supporting women who are going to vie for political positions. I think we need to have some have an agenda. We have to know what is their agenda. Not to go there and be a Mweshimiwa, there must be a, a, an agenda they want to drive. And one of it has to be this GBV. We want somebody who can stand in parliament and every day as they speak, their mouth speaks, stop GBV, stop GBV. We have to push this home until no more woman is victimized. So anyway, uh, thank you so much. I want to thank His Excellency for bringing me back to government. You know, I was out of session uh, from uh, for 2013, maybe a few months when I was voted out. And uh, I came back, I had meandered through other street families, eventually agriculture, and eventually I have landed where my heart is, issues of women and their empowerment and more so their security and safety. And that is why my agenda when I came to politics, one of them was ending female genital mutilation and insecurity uh, among the communities uh, of the North Rift because at the end of the day, women are losers. Now, let me speak as the Chief Administrative Secretary where I am seated now. I acknowledge the leadership of the Cabinet Secretary, Professor Margaret Kobia. She's such an enormous woman. She's just power, silent power, giving us the opportunity to represent her taking our calls, you know, by the way, she just, you know, she, you don't have to waste time. She doesn't want you to waste time. Just communicate with her on, on phone, on WhatsApp. And if it's too much, she will take her call. I've never seen a minister who calls her juniors. And so I also want to know the women of Kenya to know that we have a leader in Professor Margaret Kobia, uh, whose uh, aim is to ensure that every woman is safe. Uh, and so uh, now let me come to today's function. Crew, thank you for giving us this platform. 
Violence against women is one of the most pervasive violation of human rights and especially intimate partner violence. This one goes unreported. Yesterday I was in Baringo and there is a man in hospital who was burned with porridge by the wife, but he tells people, shh, he does not want. And the women, because of culturally believing that uh, I have to maintain my home, I have to show my marriage as being successful, they suffer violence without even reporting. I know of a friend, that time I was still naive, I hadn't joined politics. Unfortunately, she died. Every time we met, she will tell me, oh, she fell in the bathroom, but the letters fall in the bathroom and we went to see her in hospital. It wasn't a fall in the bathroom. It must have been a push for then we lost her. So even as we discuss intimate violence, there is a lot of work that has to be done on us women to take up the courage and speak what we go through without being embarrassed. An embarrassment can just be for that moment. The next minute, you know, they will have forgotten what you went through. It is never written on your face what you're going through unless you say. So one of the biggest challenges as we discussed today is women speaking out. So it is so pervasive because of lack of reporting and lack of courage to move away and speak about it. And so in order to understand the magnitude, the magnitude of the impact of GBV in our country, Research has shown that it costs us to an excess of 46 billion shillings annually. That is when we consider the health, the care, the legal services, the transport costs to survivors and families, and the lost economic opportunities, injury, and death. Women have to be given this so that they choose death, injury, or laughter from being stigmatized. Which one are we able to bear as women? I would rather live with the stigmatization and be alive to make a difference, to show that it is not what they're thinking. That stigma will disappear. So there's so much into communicating on this. Unless we put this in the language that women can understand. Unless we are able to talk to women that they have their hands, they are enough riches for them. So they don't have, I mean, their hands are enough to help them create wealth and show our availability to train them how to be economically empowered and put resources. We will still have women getting injured dying because they are afraid of the unknown. Marriage can be a very comfortable area, a comfort zone, where you feel someone is meeting your bills, where you feel someone is giving you an opinion when you are stuck. I like to tell people that I, me, and myself, those are more than enough for you and the creator. So despite what I'm going to say government has done, the first respondent should be the woman herself. And so it is the honors of, the, of all of us to build the capacity of the women. And that's why I said, I feel like I wish I could be on top of the mountain and shout for every woman to understand that it is time to be keen, be on the lookout. Don't lose your sixth sense, the sense of intuition because you can sense. Women, how come you're able to know a one hour child is sick? Whether you're educated or not, you're able to see. We have wisdom which we need to exploit as women. Look at the scenario, the environment you're in. Be sensitive. After all, we don't sleep. A woman is able to hear a child cough in the next room. Women, wake up. And I really hope that the launch of this 
especially uh, the segregated one, showing inti intimate partner violence, because this is where the biggest loss, the biggest hurt is from. We need to tell each other as sisters, be on the lookout, be sensitive to your environment. The way you listen to your baby who is not able to talk is the way you should listen and see what is happening around your environment and take off. So to strengthen and accelerate our efforts towards the elimination of gender-based violence as a country, the government of Kenya for the past one year has had different interventions regarding the prevention and response to gender-based violence. And when we say gender-based violence, there are so many forms. But for today, I'm grateful that now we have disaggregated to indicate this one is intimate partner violence. And this is something that I look forward to more support from the development partner so that when we are making announcement as a country, we have disaggregated data saying, out of this 5,000, intimate partner is this, defilement was this, rape was this, sexual violence was this, so that we see which one is the biggest elephant in the room. Where do we start? We must start from us being alive before addressing the rest. And so intimate uh, partner violence is very important. So the State Department in partnership with Healthcare Association uh, Assistance Kenya, HAC, is operating a national GBV toll-free line. I think all of us know that one, 1195 to provide immediate assistance to survivors through telecounseling and referrals for medical and legal services. This one, of course, our other partners like crew here, FIDA, have got also lines and even the police. But this is what I can say is happening at the State Department under the Minister of Public Service. Uh, you know that recently the State Department of Social Protection was also added into the plate of our cabinet secretary. And with that, it's about the children. Social services falls under, I mean, the children uh, of this country fall under the uh, national, the State Department of Social Services. And there, there is also a helpline used for collecting data on the number of cases reported uh, on, on children, violence on children. And so we have two numbers which I can say. Uh, are in the docket of government, that is 116 for children and 1195 for both. Although we say it's for GBV, but anybody calling that number will get assistance. So the State Department for Gender early this year launched also the Commercial Tulma mobile app. I think we also, our cabinet secretary uh, uh, launching that app and it is hash, 483 hash, 306, I mean star, 483 star, 306 hash. That can be used even by Mulika Muizi to report. Why are these numbers important? Because once we get them, we use the, we, we are able to connect to the person on the referral systems. And some of the people we refer to are the ones here with us on this uh, platform today. That even as we receive, we shall tell them, can you go over here? Home, do you know there? Uh, somebody will say, I heard about the crew. We will find out crew where you are operating. We will ask who is where. And so uh, we use this uh, uh, referral uh, pathways. We use these numbers and uh, give uh, referral pathways to the survivors when they call. And the commercial Tulma app is really key because you don't have to have these other phones. You can just use the Molika Muizi. Uh, that one. Uh, so, and again, uh, uh, the government of Kenya has established an interagency program to prevent and respond to GBV in the context of COVID-19. And so to accelerate the efforts towards ending FGM and GBV, uh, this interagency really enhanced our coordination. But you can see as we speak about coordination, most of the time we are getting cases that have already happened. What is more important is prevention. And once 
we know that there is danger coming. People will be on the lookout. When somebody is told uh, thieves are on the loose, people will start having mbwakali or they will be exchanging when they should sleep and not sleep. For example, where I come from in the North Rift, where sometimes there's a lot of cattle rustling. When our neighbors tell us, we think we have seen Wakora crossing, you will find that people prepare, maybe people will not sleep, the men that night will not sleep, they will be on the lookout. Why am I giving this scenario? Unless we, set, we, we sent out information on the dangers so that we are not uh, responding, which is so unfortunate. We are responding because people are, are already calling when they are hurt. It has to be, they are reporting that I have run away. I am here because I sensed that there was danger. So as I say, these applications that we have, the toll free lines that we all have, this is already just as a response. But as after being in the State Department of Gender for the last almost one year, I think response is more key because of the many cases that are traumatizing. You can't stop crying when you go out. Every time I go, I used to cry when girls ran away from FGM. They ran away and they were surviving without being hurt. But now I think my tears are more when I see women without body parts talking about. So we have established the interagency. We have also developed guidelines for the establishment of gender-based violence recovery centers. I want to thank UN Women because they supported us as a government to, on uh, the guidelines to, to establish a uh, uh, gender-based violence recovery center. On our part as government, we know that we have county women MPs for seven of them. And there is a fund known as National Government Affirmative Action Fund. This one is up to the women uh, MPs or county MPs to decide on how to spend. Of course, some of it is that is given guidelines for them to, to, to establish or uh, to, to build rescue centers. And so far we can say that we have uh, about 27 safe spaces that have been established. However, looking at our GBV's uh, policy and the way we allocate resources as a country, unless there is as a policy framework to inform these establishments, then there will be no funding. I must say this is uh, something that we are working on now as a ministry uh, during the review of our, our GBV policy. It was included. Thank God that we had gone ahead to establish the guidelines. And so it has been included in our policy now so that it can get a location so that the county governments where our women reps, our county MPs put up our rescue centers, the policy will inform them to allocate resources and even staffing. As we know that they don't just go to sit in those uh, rescue centers, they are going there already hurt. They need support, they need a shelter. They need somebody to tell them the sun will still shine again tomorrow because they are already seeing darkness before them. So we have developed so far 27 and we hope that by 2026, uh, we will have had all the 47 counties having uh, rescue centers. We also have a national gender sector working group that has been instrumental in the coordination of GBV with response and prevention through collaboration with our development partners and the key stakeholders, both state and non-state actors to enhance effectiveness in implementing programs on gender-based violence. Uh, we have also engaged in the national campaign to end uh, FGM. I think uh, to talk about that one is FGM. I think all of us know that the president has given that declaration and commitment to the world that by 2022, there'll be no FGM in Kenya. Uh, as a country also, uh, and the State Department, we've been working uh, with county-based GBV networks in collaboration with stakeholders to create awareness on GBV. So when we talk of GBV, you know, it is broad. 
But today, I'm grateful that we are beginning to be specific to talk about intimate partner violence. And I think this is where we shall start because when women are safe, they'll be able to listen to what uh, we are talking or what uh, is happening in around them. Uh, we, have also, we have also formed and strengthened GBV working groups at the national and county levels through the training of duty bearers. And I know that uh, by next week, maybe from 13th, we shall also be meeting uh, a state department uh, with all our gender officers who are in the counties. And one of the commitments in our government is that we have not devolved fully issues of gender. And so we still work the national government and the, and the county governments. You will find that we have our gender officers from the national government stationed at the counties working in collaboration with the uh, county uh, gender, gender officers. And I said uh, next week we shall, uh, from 13th, we shall be meeting at the quarterly meetings to, uh, to assess what have we done so far. And one of the things I know we shall be looking at is this report. I'm so glad that this report comes so that as we meet there uh, as the State Department of Gender with our gender officers, we will be able to uh, see how do we disaggregate, how do we inform our community so that we can now differentiate when we say GBV, uh, how many were FGM, how many were incest, and more so the intimate uh, uh, partnership. Uh, uh, so I think uh, I am almost through. Uh, as a government also, you know that we are committed in the Generation Equality uh, Forum we have been accorded an opportunity through the new global initiative, Generation Equality Forum, where Kenya is a leader in the action coalition on gender-based violence. And within this context, His Excellency the President in June uh, last year announced to the world 12 major commitments uh, deemed most critical for advancing gender equality and the elimination of gender-based violence and female genital mutilation by 2026 and FGM by 2022. And these uh, 12 commitments on GBV focus on strengthening accountability on enforcement and implementation of GBV laws, which we have them in plenty as a country, and also by holding duty bearers accountable. We are also committed uh, in this uh, area of uh, the GBV and uh, Generation Equality Forum, that our country will increase financing and budgetary allocation for GBV programming, including the setting up of GBV Survivors Fund, enhancing services, delivery for survivors, and strengthening utilization of data. Before I leave this page, I really want to thank CREW because though we have not shared a platform together, I have gone out there and when you talk to the survivors, they say crew gave us something to start, gave us a seed capital to start. I pray that your, 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 you, you get more funding, that your boundary lines increase so that you can support more women. Because you know, in government, the budgetary cycle is so long, we will wait until June, and then June, it, it's released in um, September. Then we review again like that. Thank you for being there for the survivors uh, in our country. So it is equally uh, important to note that uh, we have established the structures to actualize our national aspiration for the Generation Equality Forum. And the ministry will take the lead to ensure that we engage strategically with this new initiative, with all the counties where we are starting today, today, which is on the end of the month 30th, we are starting today as a state department and ministry to identify county specific priorities that speak to the needs and concerns of the ordinary women, men, girls, and boys towards the prevention and to the response of GBV under the banner Generation Equality Forum Mashinani. Jitokeze, Tuangamise Tolma, Ya Kijinsia. 
So we are starting that uh, campaign uh, today. More importantly, also, we need to demonstrate evidence by documenting what works for, uh, what works for scaling up and delivery of the desired results. And I know that today, as you release the report, as it will be documented, it will be a new beginning on how we are going to deliver services to our people. And so for accountability and as state and non-state actors, building trust, sharing information, working collectively as well as monitoring reporting on our intervention is also central towards the realization of positive change in our society. Thank you so much. I look forward to looking at this uh, uh, report and uh, story cells for as we go out and say it has been documented, it is like this. Yeah, those will be the warning signs on the road for us and for all women everywhere. So we take note that there's a demand for safe spaces and shelters for survivors on GBV, especially occasioned by the COVID-19 situation in our country. This calls for the urgent need for the county governments to invest in these facilities to meet the need for temporary relief to persons in distress from GBV. So the Generation Equality Forum commitments, which I mentioned earlier, indicates that by 2026, GBV, uh, GBVRC or gender-based violence recovery centers and shelters will be established in all the counties. This is the commitments, one of the commitments of the 12, uh, this, uh, this is uh, one of the 12 commitments as a country. And we hope that working closely with all of us, we will be able to establish the recovery centers. I want to thank, as I conclude, uh, the faith-based organizations, the private, privately run uh, shelters at the moment, because that is where we refer survivors to. I want to thank you on behalf of all the survivors. And as a government, we are grateful that you've taken up uh, your responsibility, you're taking up your space in the country because we are all of us, we are Kenyans and we need to care for one another. So thank you for all those who have come up to support the survivors, even as we are working uh, to support. What we have done best is to create an enabling environment where we are working in collaboration with you. Those of you who have been in the civil society before, like I used to be, it was difficult in some regimes earlier to operate as a civil society organization. But now the space is there where we are working together as partners. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Dr. J.B. Kilimu for the opening remarks. Thank you very much, Wangeshi, for that. And I hope participants have taken, been able to note one thing or two of what the previous speakers have just spoken. Without much ado, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Lina Digolo to kindly come and do her presentation. Dr. Lina, welcome. Dr. Lina? Um, good morning. Sorry, my internet just dropped off for a minute there. Um, if someone could help um, activate my sharing screen. Dennis? Oh, hi, Lina. Hi. I think you're the, the co-host right now. Okay, it's still not active. 
just check again because I had dropped off. I think it's an inactivated. Oh, okay. okay. So I just try right now. Just try. Okay. Okay. Uh, can you see the screen? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Fine. Sorry. Um, good morning, everybody. And, and thank you for making time to join us for this um, session to disseminate this really important study that was done by Crew Kenya um, quite last year in the midst of, of the COVID pandemic. And a lot has been already introduced by the previous speakers um, regarding why this was important. So I won't spend too much time on that, but just really to give you a brief rationale for why crew thought that this was a really critical study to do and what the study methodology was. So we all are aware that COVID-19 was here and we know that violence was escalating during the period, particularly domestic violence, um, which includes intimate partner violence and violence against the children in the homes. Um, this was um, confirmed by some of the data that we started seeing coming out in 2020 with our sexual offenses um, numbers cases increasing by 35.8%. And we know that most of the data that we had was qualitative data, giving us ad hoc numbers, but we also started seeing quite um, structured data coming in from um, partners doing um, the study. What was lacking at this point of um, doing this study was the qualitative information from women themselves talking about their experiences, um, telling us about um, what kind of support they re received. And so we didn't have the voice of the women, but we also needed to hear the qualitative information from the service providers. So that was um, led us to the key goal of this study um, to understand the experiences, women's experiences during the COVID pandemic period. Um, this was really limited to this period. So our recruitment criteria only um, included women who had undergone violence during this period, just so that we we get we got to very specific information to 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 the COVID pandemic. We had very specific objectives. One was to gain insight to their experiences, um, to understand what the common drivers. Um, and risk factors for violence during this period were, and to identify the interventions that may have worked well. Um, regard, um, this was both prevention and response interventions. Uh, in regard to the study methodology, this was purely qualitative. So you will not be seeing numbers here. We, at this point, we felt that the gap was the qualitative data. So all we have are the stories. So um, I'll not be able to, to give you any data. And we know we have those and we can access those to, to, to triangulate the, what we get from this study. Um, study areas was mentioned na, Nairobi, na, uh, Siolo, Nakuru, Mombasa, Kilifi. These are areas where crew is already working and, 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 and already has um, GBV support services ongoing. Um, we, we talked to women who had experienced IPV during the COVID period, but we also talked to key informants who are the people on, in the counties who are actually working with women to provide services. This the range was government officials, NGO staffs, lawyers, police, health providers, community and social workers. In total, we had or we analyzed 28 key informant interviews and we analyzed 33 in-depth interviews from women. So quickly into the study findings. Um, the first finding, and these are aligned to the objectives. So first, we wanted to understand the nature of violence. And in regard to nature of violence, we found the study suggested that as the COVID pandemic um, initiated, the government, we all know, gave some recommendations on um, COVID containment measures. This included self-isolation, curfew, no lockdown, school closure, all those um, um, me um, re methods that were used to contain the virus. This worked in terms of COVID, but also uh, unintentionally placed the 
the women um, who were already experiencing violence at higher risk. So what we found is that, in fact, all of the women in the study were already previously experiencing violence, but this period intensified their, their risks. They it not only intensified the risks of the violence that they were already having, it increased frequency, um, severity, and they also now started experiencing new forms of violence. And this was um, corrobor just corroborating the, the data and the report we were already hearing from different um, um, frontline workers, but also from national reports like the KNBS report that showed that about a quarter of Kenyans were already hearing or witnessing domestic violence within their community and the data from the GBV hotline that um, I'm sure we've all have seen. So just an example of one of the voices from the field, and this is an, a woman from Isiolo who said, before Corona came, he used to beat me up until it reached a point where I escaped. I could no longer stay because um, I had left my kids, so I decided to go back. When Corona came, things got worse. He would chase, a, he would chase me away with a panga and even beat me up. So you can see those were quite severe forms of violence. Um, the other um, aspect we looked, looked at was the forms of intimate partner violence that women were undergoing. Then the most common form um, um, reported was physical violence, which was beating, hitting, slapping. We also uh, got reports of other forms that we all are aware of, emotional, um, sexual, and economic. In economic violence was quite um, high during this period, and we'll be talking about this more, where the partners were now refusing to give money for basic family needs, but one of the common things was now misuse of the limited resources that were available, yet a number of the partners had lost their jobs. In many instances, the women experienced not only one, but multiple forms of violence simultaneously. So um, let's go to the next um, objective of the study, which was um, understanding the drivers of violence during this period. And this is just a snapshot of some of these um, um, risk factors that were reported by the women. So several factors aggravated pandemic during this period. The first one was disrupt disruption of jobs, which we all are aware was something quite common during this period. This caused burden, economic burden to the, to the families and increased stress, irritability amongst the calf pole and eventually led to violence. So there was the loss of income by the men who uh, in these um, communities were mainly the, the major breadwinners. And that, of course, led to um, that high stress level and violence. But there was also women who um, lost their source of income. And this really compromised their economic independence. And they found that they had to be vulnerable. They were now more vulnerable to their abused partners. And this could even limit their ability to leave the situation that they were in, uh, particularly those with children. And then there was the second that was um, um, that just aligned to that economic um, empowerment, which where men were reported to have been misusing the limited resources. And man, man, many of them were now drinking, selling things in the house to drink, um, taking property and, and, and offering to other um, side um, women outside the marriage and, and such sort of violence, which um, led to misuse of already limited resources. And then there was the, the report of um, couples spending more time together. And this was um, because of the lockdown. And this was found that couples were not really um, used to spending time together. Um, and the lockdown really took away their coping mechanisms, which included um, the securities they get from their daily routines, like going to work. So you spend less time because either the man or woman has gone to work. So you're away from the perpetrator. And, and um, they had situations where 
when stress allevi- aggravated, they could get away, but this really locked them down in a space where they had no escape me- mechanism, really leading to a high fueling the perpetration or escalating the violence. Um, those, those in some of the, of the counties where the violence was aggravated by the fact that uh, men were seen as authorities in the home and now they were at home starting to see things there was one person who actually commented that uh, you know things like even a neighbor coming to borrow salt would provoke violence but these are things that ideally the partners would not see and now they were there observing it and and was just really aggravating argument and then there was the issue of closure of, closure of support services. Um, initially, we know that um, the GBV services were not um, um, recognized as essential services. And this really limited where the women would go for support generally when, when violence was threatened or actually um, um, occurred. So, that also fueled um, the, the, the perpetration of violence. Um, there was the issue around social support, um, the, or loss of social support structures. And we know within our community, really, women have a lot of social support, be it their friends, their chama uh, women, their marketplace, um, workplace, their official work but there's the social support they get even from um they they even mentioned the 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 ngo services with safe spaces all this was taken away from women so they had nowhere to go at the initial stages of the covid pandemic you'll see that much later things opened up and they women appreciated that this really um, helped them in regard to having places to um, seek services. Alcohol use was a major problem. If there was one issue that kept coming up was this, where the men who had lost their jobs now were spending more time in the bar, spending more time drinking, and the women associated the increased drinking with increased um, violence within the home. So just a few quotes, and we have more quotes in the report. We'll be giving you an abridged version and the link to the longer report where you can see what the more voices were. But due to time, I'll just show you a few. Um, this is an example of a woman who talked about how the loss of employment increased violence. It's be, it's been more because of that training in the house because I wasn't working. I would say I was coroned by my marriage because I've been able to buy things and after you have no job and you are left, he also did not want to take responsibility. So during this COVID time, there was violence. We had nothing and it has not been easy. I gave this example because this just to show you, there was many examples about men losing their jobs, getting angry and trouble, but it also shows you that the, when women lost their, econ- their source of income, that also made them more vulnerable. And then there was um, misuse of limited resources. And you can see here, violence increased. He sold my piece of land, which I had and spent all the money. I even had a case on land. I even have a case on land matters. When he was selling, he wrote that his wife is dead. He doesn't have children. Let, yet I'm alive and I have kids. So men were now selling their you know, assets to um furnish the lifestyle that they wanted to sustain. Couples spending more time together before it it was at least because he was going to work. He is a driver, so he does not stay in the house. But when Corona came, he started staying in the house. Then it got worse. That's a woman from Isiolo. You can see increased of alcohol use. There are many examples you'll see in there, uh, a number of more examples. And, and there was, yes, it has increased that time he lost his job because he, he, so he became violent. He started using illicit brews. He would have issues at all times. That's a woman from Nairobi. And you can see there, uh, the prosecutor from Kilifi also letting us know that this was an issue that they observed. Loss of social structures, support structures. Again, we see a report here from a nurse who has been seeing many survivors. Before people would go out and share and seek those kind of services and social support, now you're at home. 
you're cut off from your peers, particularly young people. You do not have access to any information. You do not have access to your social network. So you're just alone. That again is causing trauma to most of these victims. And then there's the issue of closure of services. And you can see there that support services were closed or transformed to COVID centers. So women had nowhere to go. This was a senior official from Mombasa. So you can see those risk factors new from what we were used to um, outside the pandemic. Some of them are constant even before like alcohol, but there were some that were really um, unique to this period aggravating the issues. Um, once we understood the risk factors, we wanted to understand what, what how, what kind of services the women received during this period. So we looked at some of the interventions. And the first thing that we garnered from the um, respondents was that at the initial phases, there actually were no services. The stay at home order led to shutdown of GBV services. G some GBV centers were converted to COVID centers and women had nowhere to go. Not only, that was not only the problem, um, those service providers who were actually operating had to work within the COVID um, containment measures and advice from the Ministry of Health. So they had to limit number of survivors that would come in. And of course, this um, could due to the social distancing guidelines and this limited the number of women they could serve in a day. There was also uncertainty about availability of the services from the women and some of the services were really far. So the women stayed home because they didn't want to take the risk of going and finding the place shut down. But a number of them also said they did not go because there was already stories about health facilities being one of the places you could get the virus from. And so they feared contracting virus um, from the facilities and they stayed away. Um, the women also reported that when they went to seek services, shelter or, or alternative safe spaces, these were not available within their community. So we know this is generally um, a, a problem that um, we have across several counties. There's a lot of efforts to strengthen them. But during this period where the numbers were escalating rapidly, the services were not adequate. Let's see what efforts were put in at the county levels. So some of the common efforts that we saw across all the counties and um, were inclusion of GBV. I mean, this happened at national level where advocacy from partners, from the government, from people on the ground, from you know all the women rights organizations led to inclusion of GBV services in the essential service list. And when this happened, services opened up and we had women saying now they were able to access the services. There was a lot of effort from the counties, from the partners in terms of strengthening their GBV services. This included increasing staffing, increasing number of shelters and safe spaces, strengthening the use of toll lines and virtual services, some of which you've heard of um, here by Honorable JB, like the um, um, the mobile app, and I'll be mentioning more about that, and even strengthening legal aid and justice services. So I'll just speak about this briefly. Again, we invite you to look at the report once it's shared. So in regard to this, you can see someone, a senior official from Nairobi said they really worked hard in terms of advocacy so that um, the issues around IP, GBV being included into the essential services happened, and this ended up being successfully um, accommodated. And then those increased number of shelters, and you can see this is a senior government official in Nairobi, where they said, then we also have established guidelines to establish those safe spaces. That was uh, in terms of policy. And then you can see Yes, there are shelters. Last year, we managed to convert some of our offices to that kind of shelter. So government offices and schools were now being converted into shelters. We were working in collaboration with non-state actors to develop it and probably put some budget to make them habitable. They, are, they already identified some as a county. Then the strengthening on the hotline, you can see again from Nairobi, of course, some of those additional, there were additional interventions to revamp the 1195 to make sure that more staff were able to respond to many calls that were coming so that 
and we also made sure that 1195 was working 24 hours and it has enough staff to handle the numbers. And then those again from Nairobi, this innovation um, um, that I think they used um, to, to, to support, they said they used the commercial Duluma um, app to support their, 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 um, their survivors. And, and we've heard about this, um, so I'm not going to speak further, but these were the two main things that really supported those who could not come to the facility. Um, the, 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 Legal and justice services also did a lot. The one thing that was quite impressive is that they made efforts on, on time to make sure that they have an online court that en enabled the cases to move a bit faster during that period. Um, this was an automated service that could be accessed anywhere, even through the phone. Those who had no gadgets, the um, crew has enabled survivors to come into the office and access the court from their office. And the lawyer went on to tell us that um, he, I have several clients who have never met face to face, but through the virtual platform, I have been able to file cases, sign online through email and pleading for them and conducting and presenting their cases in court. So this was an, uh, a very good um, in, um, um, achievement from the legal part where things were being done online and people did not have to meet. And so we were still abiding to the COVID measures, but still providing services. Uh, again, the nurse, a nurse from Nairobi said, these interventions have been effective to the extent that when women come to report like for example, if they want to take legal action with the help of organizations, say like crew, we've been able to get these cases to go to court and then partners are summoned, legal actions are taken on them so that we are able to prevent them from doing harm and continuing uh, traumatizing and hurting their partners. So services opened up, we've seen innovation that was starting to happen. There were things that were working well in regard to response. We also sought to understand was prevention still happening? One of the key things that um, was noted in terms of prevention services at the initial phases is money was diverted from prevention with good reason during this period because services for response were a priority. So initially the service, the fi finances within the counties were diverted to prevention. And then with time, as, as the response intervention started stabilizing, um, the counties also started and with their partners investing in IPV prevention interventions. And the three key interventions that came up in the, in the interviews were um, IPV awareness activities, um, women economic empowerment programs, and um, the social support programs. So in regard to IPV awareness activities, several respondents reported that the county governments um, worked quite hard to um, to implement these awareness activities using media um, like radio and, and, and posters and trucks and Buddha Buddha riders to spread the word about IPV is wrong. Um, this is something that should not be happening, but also giving information about the services that are available to support the survivors. And, um, and, and this actually supported um, the um, increased uptake in services um, at a time that people were not taking them up. And you can see a policeman from Kilifi saying, we have done sensitization on the law, let people know that it is against the law to beat your wife or anyone you're intimate with. In the scenario, people don't listen. In the scenario that people don't listen, the law takes its place. Economic empowerment, we can see here from Isiolo that the one, the one that is there, and we asked them whether there was any, um, any support that they received in terms of, of economic empowerment um, programs. And they said the one that's there is from crew. The money they gave us really helped us a lot. It made me grow my business. And also I took all my children to school and bought them what they need. So they feel like other children who have a father and a mother. Social support. Um, was that um, an example of this was that many of the counties and the partners actually started supporting, providing social support to, 
to the survivors. Um, you can see there from Nairobi, we actually made sure that families were given food, um, government stimulus packages that were coming through the county commissioner offices. We actually liaised together to make sure that most vulnerable families received stipends, even though it was too little. We saw the same from other counties. You can see from Mombasa there, we offered cash transfer and in-kind support, including dignity packs with soap, sanitizers, underwear, and sanitary towels and food. So in terms of findings, that is a summary of what we found. Again, I said this report was a bit long. So again, we invite you to read the longer report in case you have any questions. I just want to quickly make some in, give you some insights from the recommendations in this report. Again, there's a longer version and, and we tried to really make um, very um, sp specific recommendations to very specific institutions and partners so that it's easier to, to digest. So the recommendations at national level to the national government were that the government should allocate additional resources to the COVID national response to the budget to address IPV in particular. Those efforts on this, but one thing that kept recurring was that the money was too little, was not enough. There's still need for resources. There's need to include policies in national level to protect survivors particularly during the contingency plan, and ensure that GBV prevention services are always included from the beginning as a list of in the list of essential services, because that delay actually was um, at the beginning um, um, was noted and we, we saw the impact of that delay. And you could see when things were opened up, those support coming in from earlier. So in future, we hope that this will actually be sustained. And then uh, there's need to expand in the inclusive social protection and financial support for women who experience IPV. And this would help mitigate the loss of income in families, particularly in times of pandemics or other emergency settings. And then um, those we recommend that um, the, the national government to develop and disseminate policies that enable women to operate their businesses and access the opportunities uh, that the government offers, both at national and at county levels, because we saw that economic empowerment was really critical as a way of prevention. And we know it's an evidence-based method to prevent violence against women. Other um, areas that could be strengthened are strengthening the mental health services for women. We know this is a very serious um, and long-lasting um, um, health outcome. And, and we, during this study, the, we had a response plan. Crew put a part of the study team was um, counseling, uh, um, counseling team. We actually had two counseling teams working together with each researcher. And every woman who attended these services um, accepted the counseling services, and it was not easy. It was, there were times when the researcher had to stop and the service, the woman gets counseling because they had no access and crew was, um, is sustaining these services for at least three months post the study. But we know that for sustainability and there are women out there who did not participate in this study who require this support. So it's an area that we think that investments could be, um, should be channeled towards. And then again, um, research is expensive. Um, the best way to collect and get data that helps us know um, more about this issue at national scale would be really to strengthen our data collection systems, um, um, both at national level, but also at council levels to in increase investments on research uh, around this space, maybe through our population surveys, or, or, or through funding research that are more broad than this study. As you notice, it was limited to five counties and so might not be generalizable. So we still think there's room for commitment at national level to get a more global picture of the nature and prevalence and, and learning more about um, experiences from other areas. At county level, we had three recommendation ones that again, policies should um, around um, should be should be put in to protect women who've experienced IPV and also just making sure that IPV is within their contingency plans and then to identify because there are 
as you can see, there are certain interventions. There's a lot of good innovations during this period. Identify those interventions that work well, both in your counties, but also outside your counties and, and, and sustain them. And, and just make sure that we are now learning from what worked and allocate resources to expand them. So that, that's a one good thing that will come out from this report because at least we now know what worked well. It's just committing to, to, to continue implementing them. And then um, they just need to strengthen response services. Um, we saw that there's, there's still a lot of work to be done around shelters. We've just heard today from um, Honorable JB that there's investment going to go into, into GBV, one-stop shop, shelter services. This is quite encouraging to hear because this was one of the recommendations we're making um, so that women have safe spaces to go when they are exposed to violence. One of the things that other countries um, really did and we could learn from is really designating safe spaces for women to be able to to report abuse without so if this if, if they if they can't get to the to the service delivery point on time there could be safe spaces like grocery shops where they just go say a code in the grocery shop is to call for help or pharmacies strategies that have been used elsewhere and have been working well so starting to think about what um can be done Strengthening our hotline, we've heard that this is already happening, but there's still work to do. And really taking up some of those innovations like commercial Luma app that women appreciated um, is something that we continue. And then we need to allocate special courts for GBV cases to just hasten the, 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 the urgent issue to deal with the perpetrators and to enable survivors to access justice. For implementing partners, we need to continue building strong advocacy awareness about violence. The, 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 the issue is still not well understood, particularly intimate partner violence and, and even more violence within marriages is still not recognized as violence within the community. The women said they had no one to talk, like they, it was almost something they had to suffer with in, 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 in privacy. So there's a lot of still those norms within the community that inhibit or act as a barrier for reporting. And so another thing is that partners could help with identifying some of those new risks that some of them we've reported here that others might continue imagine so that we are very targeted in terms of making sure that the interventions we are investing with are truly those that will mitigate IPV throughout the program. So really thinking about evidence-based uh, prevention programming is something that we should do even as we put in our investments. Um, there's need to ensure that systems are put in place that IPV survivors can access the essential response services. And those ones are, are well outlined, I mean, outlined in, our, in our guidelines. So I won't go through that. Uh, prioritize economic support and social programs for women because we saw this was really a good prevention um, strategy, both during this period in country, but we also know that WHO has now recognized this and given data that these are really strategies that work. Um, there's need to build the capacity and mentorship for women in terms of business women to improve their entrepreneurial skill, empower them both economically, even as we train them and, and teach them about gender prevention. And we know that again, combining economic um, um, strengthening programs with gender have been powerful in reducing and preventing violence against women. Again, partners, let's collect data. Without data, without evidence, we are not able to have a platform or, or anything to, to advocate with in regard to um, what works and, and where could be strengthened. Donors, we recommend allocation of funds directly to women's organizations working to address GBV and advance gender equality to ensure that the, 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 to ensure that responsiveness of the program and needs are prioritized women, because this is where the issue is. Um, there's this, we have no doubt that everyone is undergoing violence, but intimate partner violence is undoubtedly biased towards women in this country. Majority are going through it. So we still need to ensure our investments are, are aligned to that. And make sure that any funding priorities are actually aligned to our local, our local contexts. So bringing in money to inform 
programs that are already adapted or will be adapted for the Kenyan context using our Kenyan data makes a lot of sense. Researchers, there's still more work. We don't have enough data to understand this issue, particularly around the context of COVID. This is just a start. This shows the areas that we could expand on. We need to understand more about the dimensions of IPSV that women are going, undergoing. This includes the scale, um, nature of IPV and how women are affected in various settings. Here we've just presented very few settings and even you could see the numbers that we spoke to are low. There's need for more information. All actors should ensure that women are provided with meaningful opportunities to participate in leadership and decision making around their programs. They know what they want. They are undergoing the problem. We should involve them in terms of the program design, policy design, and implementation for GBB prevention, response, and coordination. And make sure that all our um, programs really take a gender dimension, particularly during this period of the COVID pandemic. We'd like to acknowledge the whole study team, particularly the women who had such a difficult time narrating these stories, telling us their stories, and, and, and helping us to be able to support um, these services moving forward. The key informants who took their time out to speak to us during a very hard time, the county management teams that really made this work, and, and the staff at the county level, both from crew and the facilities that we worked with, and the counseling team who are continuing to work to date. Um, thank you. Over to you, Isabella. Wow, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lina. Um, I can see that guys have been engaging with the conversation as you've been doing the presentation. Um, I've seen a lot of guys saying, Saumu, um, I can see um, Eric, they've all been saying this is quite a helpful conversation that they're learning. Uh, this time I'm opening the plenary for 10 minutes for any questions to be directed to Lina. And as we wait for, you can lift, just put your hand up, I'll be able to see, or my colleagues will assist me if I'm not able to see, to be able to call you out and you can ask your question to Dr. Lina. And strictly 10 minutes, so at 11.36, we'll be going to the next session. But Lina, as you, we wait for questions, there's a question from Selina Teye who says, in regards to legal aid, would you say that online courts made the hearing and resolving of IPV cases easier for victims? Um, then I see there's a comment from Elijah, who says very good recommendations. And he has gone on to also, uh, I think, expand more on the recommendations and on the policy related, um, has, and, and, and in regards to budgeting. Uh, Honorable Jabil Lina says, very insightful report. Thank you, Dr. Lina. So maybe Dr. Lina, you can start by responding to Selina as we wait to see more hands uh, going up or questions on the chat box. Can you proceed? Uh, thanks, Selina, and thank you, thanks everyone for the good comments that we're seeing will, um, on the chat box. Selina, that's a very good question. Um, regarding the legal aid, the, the, the information we got from, from this particular study came from the key informants in particular to that. And according to the service provider, one nurse, um, it seems like the, 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 the clients that they served actually uh, were able to access services through the online platform, um, which they would not have been able to access if this was not um, this was not initiated. So in regard to making it faster, we did not get that information, but at least it helped them get services that would not have been available um, during COVID. So I'm not sure if you're asking about faster in regard to if it was not online versus online or faster in, in terms of the speed between um, getting filing in and getting justice. But one thing that was very clear for us was that it took away the barrier of no services at all during the COVID period and, and, and gave an opportunity for the services, the, for service continuity. This, is, this was actually the intention from the legal team 
um, to continue services. Remember that GBV was one of the services. It wasn't specific for, it was just for all their services, but um, at least that offered that opportunity for the survivors. It's one of our recommendations in terms of maybe moving forward, having a very specific court and seeing how to expedite this process, because we know that this has some sense of urgency. We were not able to elicit that from the interviews in regard to whether the it was it was it 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 fastened it hastened the process thank you very much dr alina razia i can see your hand is up kindly unmute and ask your question razia okay as wait for razia uh joan muravi kindly go ahead and ask your question Thank you very much, um, crew, and also the panelists for this very timely webinar. Um, my question is to Honorable um, Dr. Kilimo. A lot has been done for and with women survivors of um, intimate partner violence. But my question is, what interventions have been put in place to handle the male perpetrators of IPV? How can we work more with men? who are mostly the perpetrators to stop it in the first place. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joanne. Dr. Onrabujabi, if you're still with us, are you able to respond to that question? Yes, uh, I'm with you, I'm with you. Okay, uh, kindly respond. I think, thank you, Joanne, uh, on your question about what has what have we done um, as as an intervention on the perpetrators, uh, the men? We know that uh, we have laws in Kenya, especially the Sexual Offences uh, Act in our country, and uh, sexual violence is considered a crime. But also GBV is criminal criminal also, especially where you know, people are losing body parts as such. Uh, I think our, our justice system sometimes is a problem because of evidence. Lack of evidence is what I consider uh, as the biggest challenge because they are really arrested. Yes, you report they are arrested, but somebody to give evidence is a problem. Uh, I think uh, I, I may not have a clear way of how do we intervene apart from just information and information uh, out to the women there to, to, to be careful, but also as much as they are arrested, somebody to give evidence is the, is the problem. Women are never willing to give evidence about their uh, families because uh, they are afraid of where to go. Unless now we, have str we strengthen uh, the response to support of survivors, or if they are not going back anymore, they know that there's a place they can run to, and they can stand on their feet, then they will not be giving uh, statements. Uh, I hear this being a challenge whenever we meet as, as a, a gender sector working group. That is what I gathered in the last meeting we had uh, for this quarterly reports that we has to be met to the, for the president and which we are going again to meet again from 13th in Mombasa to hear what's happening in the gender sector area. So uh, I, I believe our laws are there it's only the evidence which is not uh, proof or tight proof or watertight uh, so that the culprits are found. Some are still, uh, I had on Saturday in a meeting, they are still on the loose. Yeah, being on the loose again is still a problem because you go to a police station, the, the policeman will say those are family matters. I know there's something I had been asked to talk about polycare, but uh, since I did not see in the panel somebody from polycare, I thought then this is something that it's in, in the Ministry of Interior, although we are the consumers as the State Department of Gender. Uh, I know that they are developing a polycare. A polycare is, uh, is a, is a one-stop shop where there'll be police officers who are trained to uh, handle uh, GBV matters. And maybe, in that case, the response will be much better 
uh, going forward to get these perpetrators than now where you get a police officer with a patriarchal mindset with no gender lens considering any, any, any challenge or any reporting as just ah, those are family domestic mat matters. Uh, so I would just say that uh, moving forward, the polycare, uh, uh, which we hope to have in, a, in the 47 counties so far, we have a model in Nairobi and we have one in Nanyuki that is almost through. That might just answer the cases where women or people who go and report get proper attention. As of now, most of the people they meet at the station just wish it away as just this, is, this one is not able to manage our own affairs or something like that. So I would say that Dr. Joanne Maya Polikia might answer that one. Thank you. Right, uh, thank you very much. Any other question? Uh, I can see Elijah has gone on to expound on the issue of budgets in the national government, Asante Sana. Christine Okeno. Mm, thank you so much, and um, and thank you to Dr. Lina uh, Digolo for that very succinct and comprehensive presentation that she has done on the study. Uh, my question is uh, linked to what is it Selina asked. I wanted to know if there was any feedback from the respondents, especially on on the virtual courts, in terms of was it better for them uh, to give evidence, or did they find it a much better avenue and easier for them? that they did not have to physically face their perpetrators on the other side, maybe like it would be in a physical court and therefore better outcomes in terms of their cases, uh, if so. And then just a second question, and uh, maybe I did miss this in your presentation, uh, Daktari, forgive me. Uh, were the study areas um, chosen solely based on areas that crew is uh, currently based and operating, or was there another criteria maybe um, based on uh, maybe prevalence rates from a study or from data maybe coming from uh, the National GBV Health Helpline or from other independent helplines. Thanks and over to you. Thanks, Christine. Um, good questions. Um, the first question around the courts. Um, in, incidentally, what happened, we were talking to women at a very um, sensitive time. What we found when we went in to speak to the women is they had not spoke, spoken to anyone. Remember this, we were still in the midst of, of the, the, the pandemic. So those are really big struggle in terms of getting the, making sure we don't cross the line in terms of pushing for, for excessive information. So a lot of in the information we got from the women kept going back to them narrating how they feel, what's happening to them, what they would like, what services are not there. And so there's only so much information that we could elicit beyond what they were available to give. A number of the interviews had to stop. Remember, we had a very big component just to get the ethics um, component right. We had to work with um, what we had at hand. So the, the, the particular, some particular questions were not adequately responded to. And this is, these are areas that we could actually um, go back through program data and seek once things have settled down or do other studies to really look at some of those specific areas. The legal and justice one, most of the information we got, in fact, all came from the key informant interviews. Um, the women barely spoke about it. And, and that doesn't mean they didn't receive those services. Um, as I mentioned, majority of the women, and you'll see in the report, were more about, in fact, even getting consent was hard. We had to go back and just ask, is it okay? Because they came in and just wanted to talk. It was more of a, as a counseling session. So this was, these are the... These are some of the struggles and if you read around papers, having to do a study in that situation really requires a lot of balance about extracting the data required and allowing for space for the women to be able to, to, to give you the information they require and say enough when they have it. So that, that was a limitation of the study. We had to be very sensitive. So we didn't get, we didn't get any info. To answer you, in, in summary, that information for the legal aid and the justice system did not come from the women. Um, it came from the key informant interviews. In regard to selection criteria, 
this was a very small study. Crew had limited fundings and they decided to prioritize this study to, to just get a sense of what's happening. When you have little funding, <laughs> the best um, thing to that could help is doing a study in areas that you're already working. One of the reasons why that was needed is just because again, the infrastructure that was required to do this study was quite complex. We were doing a virtual study with survivors. We needed to ensure that we had a very good system in terms of response services, um, having counselors on the ground, and being able to respond to any emergency that happens then. So we had to limit our studies to where crew was working because that's where we knew we'd, get the, we'd superimpose the study on their service delivery. Again, our recommendation is in presence of adequate um, funding, a larger study is needed. Our study findings are not generalizable, but give us a sense of what hap is happening on the ground. I hope that's that's a response um, to your question, Christine. All right, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tari. Thank you very much for part participants for engaging. Uh, I can see my colleague has shared uh, the COVID study draft report. Kindly click on the link for further reading. Um, and now I'd like us to get into the panel discussion. As I had earlier said, we'll be having <clears throat> panelist from one <clears throat> crew, which is our executive director, Ms. Wangeshi Washira. Second panelist will be um, Ms. Mirin Jerry from UN Women. The third panelist will be Philip Lenayasa, Chief Officer, Gender County, Isiolo. Then we have Ms. Consolata Waidaka, founder of Women's Hope Center, and lastly, we have Ms. Diana Kamande, Executive Director, Come Together Widows and Orphans. And so um, I'll start with Ms. Njeri. Ms. Njeri, you recently did a study, a global report on measuring the shadow pandemic that indicated that about 80% of women and girls in Kenya have experienced GBV during the pandemic. And so as a donor organization, what do you think you can be able to do to be more responsive to GBV issues within the country's given context? Mm. Ms. Jerry, Karibu sana. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and, and, and I also wish to to thank um, the, pre the the presenter on the um, on the report, very very well done. Uh, and Dr. Lina, I'm sure we will continue to interact on this um, on this report. And yes, it is true that um, UN Women under its um, rapid gender assessment undertook a study uh, on issues or on effect or on prevalence of violence against women during this COVID period. And um, it was, it's dubbed as rapid because then it was uh, specific to, to the certain situation that was happening. And the purpose was really to be able to establish what, what it is that is uh, taking place and what are the areas of concern. And it's true like um, Kenya, uh, rated very highly, especially when it came to women who had uh, experienced um, escalated uh, violence. And it was at all levels, it was at various, uh, I mean, it, it was an uh, intimate partner, it, it rated intimate partner, it also rated um, in uh, violence in open spaces, especially when you come to public spaces, uh, sexual harassment at the time, and many women actually expressed fear of being out now during COVID um, than they felt before. And actually uh, for Kenya, it was next to Bangladesh. Bangladesh had 93 and uh, Kenya had 80%, so which we found pretty high. Um, being as it may, of course, these studies are done so that uh, yes, uh, just as uh, I'm sure crew is aiming to, is to look at um, what are the areas of intervention, what can be done, and uh, just following up on, so what about the study? 
and I'm sure many, many various uh, quarters would need such studies. And it has also been mentioned by Dr. Lina that um, issues of data uh, are a problem, are lacking, but are necessary for there to be really informed and evidence-based um, informed interventions. So that, that said, and back to your, to, to your, um, uh, to your question, and oops, uh, being the Mary I am, I completely forgot to do, uh, to, to recognize protocol. So uh, <laughs> Dr. JB, my friend, uh, thank you for being here. And uh, it's nice to have you. It's just that uh, maybe I jumped into the issue other than just recognizing uh, your presence and the role uh, that you've continued to play and the partnership we've had with you even during these 16 days. And uh, also to congratulate um, Diana on the launch of uh, the book. Um, what can be done uh, to, to enhance, I mean, to, to enhance support? I think, and I think um, Dr. JB alluded to the fact that Kenya has committed to the 12 um, very key and very bold uh, commitments and committed really to Kenyans, to women and to the world that um, really we, we can take measures that can end um, violence against women and particularly um, uh, also uh, including uh, uh, FGM by 2026. So there are certain steps that can really be made that one, there's the need of really looking at preventive measures. And these preventive measures are, um, can be multiple prong. They, they are different entry points, but we can look at how do we ensure that communities really are activated towards prevention? How do we really make communities aware and sensitized to say no and to feel that it is not the norm? This thing that, um, Sisi kwetu ni kawaida, you know, like uh, part of what was found out in our report was that um, uh, kuchapwa ni kawaida, you know, like, or it used to be there, but now it's escalated. And we are looking at an escalation of a situation that has been normalized. So how do we ensure that communities don't normalize this situation? How do we ensure that little children, girls are involved so that they don't, normal, uh, they, they don't find it normal? I was um, once amazed by, um, I have an 11 year old daughter. And one time she told, she asked the show show when we were all there, that show show, would you rather a divorced daughter or a dead daughter? And we were, and she was nine and we were asking, eh, umeto apio? She said, but look at TV, someone is, has been burned and she's so badly burned. And, and so sometimes we imagine that children don't see these things. And we imagine that they do not know the differences. And sometimes um, we imagine that we want to stay and, and, and we never want to question why women stay because there are various reasons that lead to them staying, including our support system or lack of it. But that it is important for us to really sensitize the whole community to support a survivor, to support the whole family, whether you're, a, whether you're secondary, whether you're primarily affected or secondary affected. We find that parents will actually be secondary affected. And for that reason, they will want someone to go back. So these are measures that really, it could be one, it could just be one number, but then when the whole community is put to it, is activated, there's what we can really term as community activism around it. The other thing is that we need to engage men and boys. I know we have moved from violence against women to gender-based violence, and we have used the terms interchangeably. And many times we've said, oh yeah, even boys, oh yeah, even men are violated, which is, which is true and which is not correct to really be violated just because you either a man, just the way, same way we say no violence against women, it is the same thing that there's no, there shouldn't be violence against men but also working with men as champions, working with men to, to really respect women's rights, to really hold women at a level where that it is not okay to hurt a woman. It is not okay to even use abusive terms. It's not okay to even disrespect a child, a boy, 
starting to disrespect girls, starting to disrespect, disrespect the mother. So it is not okay. And so working with, uh, engaging men as champions so that they can talk with men, they can actually be able to, to say no, both for themselves, for others, but also to actually do it in a protective way. So when you're looking at um, the, prevent, um, the prevention and how then the support can be, can be given, we would also be going on to the realm of, for example, um, legal, um, legal reform, or particularly law enforcement. We have, I believe we have the laws. I believe a lot really exists. And we've already had, I mean, Polycare has, is coming up. We know that um, there are new laws. There's already um, PDVA that is already uh, starting to be implemented, but the implementation of it, the, activi the, the actively, uh, the active uh, implementation of the law by all of us, and by all of us, meaning that none of us should really be a bystander. Should you be a supporting agency? Should you be a civil society agency? Should you be me, an individual? Anyone not to bystand so that the implementation can be there. You know, this language of Alimpiga, I mean, it's, it's wrong that then a perpetrator is perceived to be more powerful, is feared, is, is, is taking pride in intimidating and therefore continuing to accelerate their, their violations. So the implementation um, of the laws, we really act as deterrent and really enhance uh, a prevention. Isabella, I can't hear you. I can't hear you, Isabella. Sorry, I was still muted. Asante Sana Mary, that was uh, really good. And indeed, you have been able to highlight some of the things that I think as you and women, you're keen to look into to ensure that you're more responsive to the needs as you, as you give money to civil society, to the needs of the women and girls in this country. <clears throat> Our next panelist is uh, Mr. Philip. Mr. Philip from Isiolo. Are you with us? Yes, uh, I'm with you. Good morning, uh, good morning, Mr. Philip. Morning. My uh, question to you, my question to you, Mr. Philip, is first, congratulations to Isiolo yes. County to joining, being amongst the five counties in the country uh, yes. that have a gender-based policy. We are looking forward to officially launching the document, but indeed it's a very good step. And so I think we would like to know. So you have a policy in place and to ensure that it does not just become just like any other document uh, get gathering dust in the shelves, what are some of the things that you intend to do or are currently going on to ensure that the policy will be implemented? Uh, thank you, Sabella. Um, um, Honorable Dr. Uh, uh, JB uh, Kilimo, our CAS for gender, uh, the UN Women Representatives, Mary Jerry, and uh, the crew CEO, Wangeshi, um, uh, Dr. Uh, the uh, Galo who presented uh, uh, the report, uh, my fellow other panelists from uh, the various uh, CSOs, uh, and all those that are present, uh, and those participating in this webinar, uh, I would like to thank very much the organizers of this webinar, it came at the right time, and the research was also done at a very right time. I know that Terry had a tough time, it, because uh, uh, at that time, uh, there was a lot going on. That is when we go to the most of SGBV cases going on. Um, just uh, thank you for 
uh, our partners, they are the ones who made us realize the gender policy uh, led by support from UN women, uh, crew taking the lead and uh, KWOPA also being part of us during the implementation and our partners who worked through us, the technical working group, uh, our assembly for, for taking it up, our cabinet for passing it without even, uh, you know, any correction. Instead, they added uh, more way to it. And uh, our women caucus in Isiolo for taking it up uh, at the assembly floor and making it uh, pass and that we are now awaiting the great day to launch it. Um, and just to speak a little about our, our policy, uh, it goes around the issues uh, that affect gender. That is uh, labor and economy. Uh, those are some of the thematic areas that we are addressing in our policy. Access to healthcare, food security and nutrition, peace building and uh, conflict resolution, leadership and governance, uh, water and sanitation. We realize women play a great role in our county, not only in our county, but our country for uh, when it comes to water issues, yet they are not quite represented in the boards that manage even water at the village level, a borehole uh, or, or a dam. And in this situation, we want to see more of them getting involved in the management of water and the sanitation of it. Uh, land environment and natural resources, early childhood development, and uh, technical and vocational educational training. These are the thematic areas that we are addressing in this policy. Uh, we already have uh, programs that have been going on, uh, either done by the national government and uh, also by our county and by our partners. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our partners because they have always walked the talk with us, even at the time of COVID, when some of them had to cut their funding, they were still able to work with us uh, where uh, limited finances were available. For instance, now carrying out this SGPV report uh, and I'm impressed and uh, happy that this year was part. Um, there are a lot of activities going on regarding the gender policy, which we had already started implementing. Uh, after the launch, the, the main thing through the implementation would be to start putting the technical working group together to start putting uh, an act that would support the policy so that some of what we are doing can now be legislated within our assembly so that we can implement as a sector. Uh, the other one is that we have been uh, uh, approaching these uh, issues of SGBV in different circles. Uh, we have addressed it. We know in our county, uh, we have uh, a form of gender violence, which is uh, FGM. We have been approaching it uh, and we know FGM is actually happening uh, at the age of under 18. So those are children. And uh, we are addressing that uh, through the Children's Act. And so we have been working together uh, with our partners, the Children's Office, the National Gender Office, uh, ourselves. And uh, we have now developed a draft ISIOLO uh, with support from UNICEF of ISIOLO a child protection policy and legal framework. We know child protection is still not a devolved function, but uh, the children belong to people of the county. And so we took a bold step to have uh, a children protection policy, which is now at the draft level. Uh, we are taking it to cabinet and see it also passed so that we can address the issues of child protection in that angle. And then uh, we have been having sensitizations across, across all the 10 wards in our county. 
we have already sensitized them on SDBV, uh, especially at the time when COVID was there. And uh, when we knew children were not going to school, early marriages were happening, and also uh, early pregnancies. And uh, we, uh, we visited every ward, and we were able to tell them uh, the dangers of SGBV. Uh, we also were able to put our area advisory council or committee together at each sub-county, uh, which is uh, chaired by the DCC, and uh, all the players are now active. We never had uh, uh, area advisory committees, but we have now rejuvenated them. Uh, it was only working in one sub-county, Garbatula, through support of World Vision, but now uh, we have in all the three sub-counties, Merti, Isiolo, and Garbatula. Uh, we have also had a very big, two great meetings with our faith-based and our council of elders and uh, discussed this matter at that level. We also know that uh, at Isiolo is where we began the issue of uh, Borana Council of Elders going to meet the Gumigayo uh, Assembly in Ethiopia to declare uh, FGM practice within the Borana community illegal. And uh, also after that, the Samburu Council of Elders, we know His Excellency the President visited Samburu to hear from the elders there, and the same is being replicated uh, where uh, that community lives. So we have used several approaches to try uh, to address uh, these forms of gender violence. And um, the other one is that uh, we, through the support of crew, we have the gender champions who are very, very active. At the time of COVID, we have the 60 of them in the county, and uh, they were very, very instrumental together with the child protection volunteers in addressing uh, these issues. They were visiting homes, they were visiting communities, and they, were, they have raised the level of awareness of SDBV in our, in our county. We have also trained the referral systems. We have trained the health workers. Uh, we have trained the police, 40 of them, thanks to crew support. Uh, we have also trained uh, together uh, the child uh, uh, protection volunteers together with child uh, protection uh, providers and uh, on referral systems. And now we also had a very good meeting where we had all these players of SGBV in our county come together. We had the judiciary in play, uh, presenting on their role, the ODPP, uh, the police, uh, the health uh, workers, specifically the clinical officers and the nurses and the doctors. And then uh, we had uh, early childhood officers and the child protection officers together with faith-based. Uh, and now the referral system is well understood. We know we have a gap that we are trying to address, which is data collection, because the police, they have a desk, they collect any form of uh, SGBV from their desk. The health departments and dispensaries also collect the data when it is reported to them or when they uh, treat these victims but uh, the, we want now to coordinate this data so that we know where do we get the most and, why does, and what type and uh, how do we address it. So that at our technical working group, which is uh, where we take some of our decisions, uh, we can get our players and the ideas and managerial uh, decisions which can help us on the best homegrown solutions that we can use. So basically those are the few things that uh, we are doing uh, together with our partners in implementing the gender policy. And uh, there, are, uh, there are many, many uh, uh, issues that we all are going to address in this policy based on those thematic areas. Thank you very much, Philip, and thank you for being brief.
Uh, truly, truly, we continue to laud the county for the very progressive step that they have taken in ensuring that first recognizing that the issue of gender-based violence is rife in, the, in their county and also just being able to come up with programs and initiatives that will ensure there's enough prevention, protection and support for the women. Uh, our next panelist is uh, um, Ms. Consolata Waizaka, founder of Women Hope Center. Ms. Waithaka, we know you have been doing a lot, especially last year since when COVID broke. Uh, the things that we have heard from the reports that Lena has just spoken about, we know that you have firsthand experienced that. Would you kindly do tell us in about five minutes, what was your experience when handling the survivors of gender-based violence as an institution? What, what were you experiencing when trying to ensure that you are providing a safe haven for the victims or the survivors? And at the same time, as you're trying to ensure there's a safe haven, you're trying also to ensure that they get all the support and services that they need. Consolata, the floor is yours. Consolata? I'm sorry for that. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, Dr. Chebi Kirimo, cs for Jeda, uh, my fellow panelist, um, and uh, I'm so excited and happy to be here uh, to be talking about what I love most and what I really like doing day to day, seeing a woman heal at our center, and. Uh, I'd also want to say um, maybe at this point that we have been where we are because of crew. So we thank uh, Madam uh, Wangeshi, the CEO crew, for the support of the last one year that uh, we have been having uh, the upside of all the cases of the, the issues related to gender-based violence. We have been at our center, we receive many cases, various cases. And uh, at the center, we have the women and the children but more so what uh, happened, uh, what came to us during the COVID, the cases were on the rise. Uh, because I remember most of the, since uh, July, we have recorded over 200 survivors, women and children coming to our center. And uh, to, uh, to cap that, we, if we didn't have the, the support of the crew, it could have been very difficult because uh, we have a very beautiful, we call it a hearing center. It's a beautiful center where women come and find that hearing space. And uh, if, without that, of course, it's a rental home. We could not have been where we are. We are getting the, 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 the person, the owner of the, the, the center asking, of course, the, the, um, for the rent. And uh, maybe to note that uh, our center has been uh, doing activities which has been supporting the center. But since COVID came, we have like um, where like volunteers come from all over the world and they stay at the cottages. But since COVID hit, it was hard to, to support the, the programs we have at the center. So that was one of our challenges. But I can say we have really supported many survivors since uh, COVID hit. And uh, to the support to the now to, uh, to, call, to crew is to say we have been humbled for the, for the support. And uh, for sustainability of the center and the women who have been coming to our center, we have been training these women on various uh, skills. And uh, we have seen when women come at the center as they are healing, we do a lot of counseling. We do a lot of spiritual healing because I've realized women come with a lot of void. Most of them say because of the violence, they have even not detached them, themselves from the church. Others don't, their husband don't allow them to go to church. So they had, they had, they have a lot of um, uh, heart in their, in their, in their heart. They are heart so hard that every time you talk to this woman, she just need a whole a whole week or few days to cry before you have even start the counseling. So uh, for us, we have been having three pillars for this woman to heal. We have been doing a lot of counseling, a lot of physical. Of course, we take them to clinics, to hospitals, those who are physically at, and we have a long, a, a, um. A uh, spiritual touch where we get people to, we have everyday devotional uh, time with the pastors that most of the women say I've never felt this close to God. 
So that is one of the, um, the, the support we give these women and they take a um, shorter period to heal. And uh, maybe the other one you are asking how we think um, we need uh, the safe houses supported. It is very sad till this time and age, um, our centers uh, the, uh, around the, the country, we are called uh, private homes. Um, basically because of course we are not registered by the government. It's something we have been trying to do over five years now, uh, trying to set policies and saying like now we need, we have the guidelines as private homes, private uh, safe houses. But how can we be recognized by the government? Because this one will really uh, help people also out there to know there's a, uh, there's a place one can run to. There's somewhere one can say, this is my second home after maybe this woman is going through so much uh, uh, violence. So for me, it's uh, maybe that now I was, uh, we are having uh, Dr. Chebi Kirimo, she mentioned about, um, the guidelines, the guidelines which also policies the government's incentive for the safe houses. How can we see that uh, maybe most of the, the awareness is there. People know uh, that uh, the 1195 is there. They can call. Uh, I'm happy crew has been really be on the, on the grassroots, on the ground, uh, ensuring that any woman will call that they rescue and take them to safe houses. But how can we say that we can do partnership because uh, the mapping has been done. Countrywide, I think uh, like now they, we can see there are over 40 safe houses, private as they are called. But how can we say we are working in partnership with the government instead of re reinventing the wheel? What do we have on the ground, these, safe, these uh, safe houses, that we can say it is closer to the women? Instead of like now I get calls from Nakuru, you get uh, calls from Kajiado. How can we say these uh, facilities are closer to the women who need them? And uh, also, how can we ensure that uh, our voices, the voices of these women at the safe houses, as they leave the center, sometimes there's that so much cry of, okay, I want to go, I want to leave. Uh, my kids uh, are here with me, maybe for example, for three months. Most of the people don't leave the safe houses because they, are, they have failed. Most of them, they feel like, okay, now I need to go because my kid, I'll have to go back to my husband because my kid is missing out of school. What can we do to ensure the safe houses that we'll get, they can have even in schooling, uh, homeschooling, that kids can be able to attend school uh, wherever, whatever time that the mother is spending at the safe house. I'm happy to say that our safe house, we don't have a limited time that you'll come and I'll tell you within two, three days or two, three weeks, you can go. We take you through the healing process. And it is the, the survivor who will say, now I really need to go. I'm feeling physically, emotionally, spiritually, I'm strong enough. I can go out there and start. Uh, I'm happy still to say crew has been on the ground supporting these women. And uh, the women, uh, when we have the safe house with the holistic uh, safe house that the woman can have their kids going to homeschooling, having the volunteers even who are taking these kids through the, 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 the program that the mother is not having to, to, to feel like she needs to heal, but still she's thinking about the kid who is missing out of school. So that's what I've been thinking is uh, because we have been now on the ground, like now over 13 years with the safe houses. And sad enough, most of the people, the survivors, when they come and uh, they will say, unfortunately, this is something so many women are suffering out there. Unfortunately, it's not known. And um, what can we do on the ground uh, as the, the maybe, as we are saying, the, the organizations? working towards the betterment of these survivors. Okay, create, uh, awareness creation is there, but can we have maybe visits to ensure that ourselves, uh, the people like uh, the organization, people working in the civil society, can they visit these safe houses to ensure even when we are saying we, we are referring clients, we are referring the survivors to the home, how can we ensure that, okay, it is not something we are just reading on the books. It is on the ground and we know where it is and how it is. It is being carried. How it, how, what are the guidance in that safe house? Are you comfortable saying you are referring a client? So, uh, so much has been done. I'm happy uh, for the partnership, for the awareness which has been created so far, but I feel like so much has, uh, need, we need to do so much. 
um, I'm happy maybe this is the time I can mention about uh, what we are planning as women. So we are trying, these 16 days we'll be having to tell people of the same interest, those, all the uh, partners who have been working to GBP, how can we come and visit Uman Soap? I would want, we are opening the, it is of course invited uh, guests that we can come because of the safety of this uh, survivor. How can we come and ensure, we are, the, we are stamping and saying, we have seen the, this safe house and we are so proud this is what is happening. How can we hold hearts that our safe house can hold over hundred survivors? Unfortunately, we don't even reach to 30% of the capacity because of so many issues, so many uh, things we need to, uh, to settle with. Uh, we, of course, uh, there's the water, there's other administration costs. But how can we say this is a center we can work with, uh, with the, uh, within our Nairobi County or within the, uh, the, the periphery of, uh, of Nairobi, uh, um, the, uh, Nairobi env en environs? that people who are in from Kiabu, we get a lot of people from Kiabu, Kajiando, because it's just within, how can we work together? And we say, this is for the betterment of the, of the, the survivor, the women and the children. And uh, 11, you'll be having our, our run just to still tell people, creating awareness. I'm liking the way this, uh, of course, we are talking about in the world orange within uh, with, uh, our, um, the theme. How can we let people know? Of course, we are not disclosing where safe houses are, but the key people should know this where, what are the capacity? What can we do to ensure? So we are having all these calls. How can we even support? And I believe we can work to synergize our work and uh, we feel like we are working as partners. Over to you, Christine. indeed. Uh, you've not only just highlighted the issues, but you've also been able to articulate how you've managed to circumvent uh, and ensure that survivors of gender-based violence have been treated and treated well with dignity and have been given time to heal. Lastly, our last uh, person to speak today is going is Ms. Diana Kamanda, Executive Director, Come Together Widows and Orphans. Congratulations, uh, Diana, on the launch of your new book, Scars of Honor. From the launch on Friday, you did intimate that the book is based on experiences of survivors of IPB. Could you, in five minutes, tell us some of the experiences uh, the survivors have gone through in the context of uh, COVID-19? Karibu sana, Diana. Asante sana, thank you so much. Um, and uh, first of all, I would love to uh, start by thanking everybody who has given me a lot of support, crew, UN Women, our government through the State Department for Gender, and now all protocols observed. I would love to um, talk briefly about Scars of Honor. Um, Scars of Honor is a book that I wrote one, because I went through uh, domestic violence. Gender-based violence is, um, it, it, is, it is becoming a national disaster in this country. And before I went, it, I, was, I went through it, I was so quiet in my own cocoon. I didn't know what women were going through. And even me, I was going through gender violence, but I normalized it. I thought some things were just okay. It, uh, it was humility as a woman, it was submissiveness. But now when COVID hit last year is when I came to realize it was more than what we had been talking about. I was talking about gender violence because I survived and had met a few women. But last year is when I met, I, I, I came uh, to see what women were going through because I could be called to rescue women even during very odd hours of the night. And it was at this moment when uh, I reached out to uh, crew, uh, executive director, um, Ms. Uh, Leah Wangeshi, who told me I should not keep quiet. I should continue raising my voice. And crew came in in a very good, in a very big way. God bless you so much. Because we were able to rescue very many women, send them to safe spaces. And also uh, crew was able to give cash transfer to most of these women. 
Uh, one uh, very sad case that I came across was a case uh, that I referred to crew and this woman got help. This woman uh, was just about to be killed by the husband. The husband had already uh, bought some petrol and wanted to burn the, uh, the lady inside the house together with the, with the children. And I referred her, I don't know whether she was that open the way she told me, uh, I referred her and she got psychosocial support. She also got a phone because the husband had taken the phone away from her. She got a phone, I think still it was from crew and you took her through counseling and she is now outside there. She has been able to rent her own house. And I think she has she has benefited from Jasiri Fund. I'm yet to follow up because she sent me some pictures of her business. So uh, this is one of the things that I came to realize. Women are being oppressed because they don't know where to run to. COVID-19 uh, COVID exposed these situations that women were going through violence, but because uh, their partners or their spouses, sometimes they step outside there to go and work. And some of these women, they are also in other businesses. So the women don't have too much time. So the lockdown brought the, the, the spouses together, whereas the, the, this woman is with the perpetrator full time. So I think this uh, really contributed so much. And I think uh, introduction of Jasiri Fund and all the, all, all the other funds that we have, the Women Enterprise Fund and the others, they are, they are going to bring a whole difference in the lives of these women. And that's why um, we need economic empowerment on women so that if this woman sees the red flags, they can easily walk away because they are economically empowered. Another type of uh, survivors that I was able to uh, introduce to crew was the widows. You know, widows go through, whatever widows go through is gender-based violence, but uh, our society tries to uh, sugarcoat it that this is our tradition, this is what our culture dictates. When the number of uh, mourners was reduced to 15, these women were subjected to harmful cultural practices and there was nobody to speak on their behalf. I remember one woman I also referred to crew who came back to Nairobi to an empty house. The in-laws had disinherited her, everything in the house, uh, including her own children, children's clothes. So crew came in handy for her and she was given cash transfer. And I also introduced her to another organization that was also able to support her. I, uh, I introduced her to a certain pastor in a certain church who was also able to support her. So I believe we have to come together and continue supporting the survivors and ensure that women who raise their voices, they are able to get the support they need before it happens. We don't have to keep going, rescuing a woman because she has been hit. I don't know whether this morning you have come across this story uh, of uh, a very sad story of what has happened in Kirinyaga County, where a, a man has just killed a woman and their four children. It was so sad that as much as in we continue raising our voices, it's still continuing to happen. And uh, as we, we continue marking the 16 days of activism, we have lost five lives this morning, and that is just one of the reported cases. We don't know how many are still undercover, not reported. So it was a very, uh, it was a learning experience for me last year. And I came to realize the importance of organizations having a fund, because before Wangeshi came on board, the women that I had, I had been able to rescue, I was taking them somewhere uh, because I had made arrangements, hotels were closed. So I made arrangements with one of the hotels along Thika Road because they were not using their, uh, their guest houses. That is where I was hiding these women. So it is important for the organizations to have funding because all that I did, we were, we were all closed. I could reach out to friends who could support me. And then when I, I told Wangeshi what was happening, she told me, no, no, no. Can you refer those women to crew and we will be able to support. I have seen a great, great change and God bless you crew, UN Women, the Department for Gender, 
and uh, also the toll-free number crew 1195, uh, our work has become very easy because we are growing. We don't have that uh, toll-free number and we don't have to create toll-free number for every organization. I believe uh, the ones that are there, we can continue referring women and they continue getting help. And uh, as I wind up, I would love to um, tell you that uh, you, can, you can read about my experience from my book, Scars of Honor. It's a book that uh, it's, it has my own experience uh, about how I went through gender violence. I survived and I started the, this organization to help women like myself. And uh, also I thank every woman who has been part of my journey. And even those I've met along this journey that we continue uh, to work together. Thank you so much and God bless you. Thank you very much, Diana. Um, indeed, that was brave of you to just come out and be able to put what we went through into words, just to, put, to encourage uh, more people, survivors, as well as people also not survivors. We indeed uh, celebrate you. Um, attendees, thank you very much for being patient with us to this far. I apologize for taking a bit of more time than we had anticipated, but then it's because the conversations have been quite rich, have been quite exciting, and we did want to be able to give everyone an opportunity to be able to talk. Uh, and so we'd like to come to our conclusion today. And uh, I would like to call Ms. Swangeshi to come and give us uh, the concluding remarks. And afterwards, people can leave at their own leisure. Our communication officer, uh, Christine, will also be sharing two briefs with the participants. Kindly open them, read them. They will be able to respond to some of the questions or just be able to enhance the conversations that we have been having today. Thank you very much to everybody and thank you for your patience. We do not take it for granted. Uh, Ms. Wangeshi. Thank you, Isabella. I think for me, from the bottom of my heart, is really to thank everyone for sparing your time and being with us uh, for the last, um, we've been here from 10 and now going to 12.30. So we really appreciate you taking time to be able to listen to the study that we've been able to collect data, speak to the brave women who were able to share their stories. I, keep, I continue to, to celebrate uh, their bravery to share with us uh, their story. I would also want to thank our moderator, um, Isabella, for, for really uh, facilitating this uh, conversation very well. Um, our panelists, thank you. Thank you so much for, you know, within the shortest time you are able to come in and really be able to share the work that you're doing, but also give us hope that this work, because without hope, I think we will not be able to continue uh, really pushing the needle and see where the change uh, is going to come. Um, Honorable Javik Limo, thank you for all the work that you're doing with the ministry. We know with you right there is that um, our conversation this morning, our recommendations that you're making to the ministry, that you're going to be able to speak in those spaces so that then we can be able to bring uh, the change. I don't want to forget um, the research team uh, with uh, Dr. Lina Digolo, um, working with the women in the, in the various counties, speaking to the women, speaking to the service providers, we really uh, value the partnership that we've had uh, with you. Uh, to my colleagues uh, who've been able to organize this webinar, this work cannot be done alone. We have a team that continue to put their time, to put their sacrifice. Dennis, uh, Christine, uh, Joshua, um, our leadership team, uh, Mike, um, Angelina, Dina, you know, and all our legal team, uh, we see you, our counseling team, our case managers, you know, you are the front line and you continue to do all the weight lifting. When the women come and call, you never tire, you make sacrifice, you go beyond the five o'clock. By the way, this is beyond the job. You go um, at night listening to the survivors. Uh, over the weekend, you're still supporting. We really, really appreciate all that, that you do and all the women rights groups that you're, you've been able to join from the counties. I saw people from Kilifi, I saw people coming from Narok, 
uh, from Meru in different parts of the country. We really appreciate all the time. I think we have uh, recommendations here and also the recommendations that were made in the, uh, the 12 commitments by Kenya. I had someone asking, is it possible for shelters to be supported? Under universal healthcare, is it possible to make shelters as part of the hospitals that are covered by the National uh, Insurance Fund? So that if a survivor comes there, we know the National um, Insurance Fund can be able to support them. Can we be able to push that at the county level so that uh, Consulate, even she's supporting survivors in Nairobi, Kiambu has a center. Nakuru, as she said, has a center so that then we can be able to bring the change. So I want to thank each and every one of you for your time. The report is ready, has been shared here. Please get a copy, uh, use it for your advocacy, use it for more research so that then the women can be able to live um, um, in a peaceful world. And we know and we believe that one day perhaps we'll have the history of Kenya goes that uh, women used to be abused. You know, that I look for a day that that will go to history. In the meantime, let's then make that part of history by doing our little bit. Just like Professor Wangari Madai said, as a hummingbird, let's just do our little part. The little part is the one that is going to bring uh, change in the world. So thank you everyone and wishing you a good afternoon ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ageshi. Kwaherini, everyone. And thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.